I'm Larry Schaefer. I used to own the Canes Ballroom, owned it for 25 years. Probably wasted my youth here. Met all kinds of interesting people. One of them was Leon Russell, of course. There were, there were occasional concerts that would come to the Assembly Center, which was our, our new arena. It came in 1962. But there weren't many of them. Uh, James Brown, Three Dog Night, uh, The Animals, Herman's Hermits. Uh, 19, November of 64, I attended a, a show with the Rolling Stones here in Tulsa. I still got my $3 ticket stub from that day. And the Beach Boys started coming in 64. So that was kind of the climate. So there might have been three or four concerts a year that would come to Tulsa. Um, and there wasn't much of a music scene. Uh, because it seems in early in early 60s, the Tulsa guys seemed to migrate, including Leon Russell. There was a migration out to Los Angeles, and Jimmy Markham has told me, and I think Leon told me too. They went out to L.A. not to become stars. If you had a good band from around here, and there were great musicians, as we all know, from around Tulsa area, you could take your band out there and work seven nights a week in the clubs where you might struggle to find a gig here more than once a week. So there was a migration in the early 60s out there. Leon was one of them, J.J. Cale, David Gates, Jimmy Markham, uh, Karstein, Gary Gilmore, uh, just a who's who of the Tulsa Sound was out there. So to me, it was, it was kind of a dead, there was kind of a dead zone in the early 60s because all of our guys were out there working and making money. And of course, we know what happened with Leon. He was such a genius and, and his re, uh, his production uh, talents, putting the right musicians together and picking the right material. It was, it was happening. In fact, in 71, 72, when I managed to just to get started in the business, <clears throat> I moved to Tulsa and really was not connected. I didn't, there wasn't a social network that I was part of, but I, I drank, Leon was, was here and he, and he was, very present and the church studio was was being developed and 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 great stars were coming into Tulsa like George, uh, George Harrison and Eric Clapton it was flat happening here and I wasn't a part of that I wanted to be so bad but all that that click that that niche of people that that were in Leon circle both the church and over at his house off Peoria that's where I wanted to be and I you know if I'd had my way, I would have given up every act that I was intent on booking if I'd only had that steady relationship with Leon. That's, that, was my, that was my dream, that was my goal back then, to be Leon Russell's show producer, promoter. And as it turns out later on, I probably, I most likely booked him more than anyone in the state in different, uh, the different situations. As time went by, I, I booked Leon dozens, dozens of different places. I put, brought him into Kane's Ballroom here several times. I featured him as a uh, headliner in various venues, Arkansas, Oklahoma, some in Kansas, Texas. And then uh, in the last 10 years, I worked pri uh, primarily with Willie Nelson. And I, and I was a very big part of his tours and played shows with him probably in 44, 45 different states. And any time I had the opportunity, I would put Leon on the show as a support, support act. And those guys liked each other and they had a lot to talk about always. So more and more, I, uh, I was uh, exposed to Leon and worked with him, loved it. I don't think there had been a scene of any kind of higher level in this town. You know, we all know about Bob Wills, Texas Playboys, here in this building. Uh, it, it lived here, it was created here. Hit, rec hit records that came out of here because they were written right up there on the bars where San Antonio Rose was written in pencil. Uh, that was the big scene. And, uh, but when Leon decided to come back here from California, it was a thrill. It was absolutely a thrill for, not only for people who want to be in the music business, but for fans. I mean, he was our rock and roll star. And he'd come home and, and he had a Rolls Royce and, and you know, you would hear stories, hey, we saw Leon driving his Rolls Royce down Peoria yesterday and we waved at him. I think we saw George Harrison in there with him. It was, it was exciting. It, it added an element of electricity in the air. 
because stuff was happening here. It wasn't just happening in Nashville or especially in Los Angeles where Leon had migrated back from. It was right here in town. It was, it was a big damn deal. And uh, I managed to get my toehold in and, you know, get in, start a relationship with them. It took years for me to get to know Leon because he was so introverted. You know, I'd make an attempt, but it was pretty much, hey, thanks, thanks for, for working for me tonight. And hey, Larry, thanks for booking me. That was kind of the way it went. And the, I think there was an instance that uh, my good friend Matt Harris, who happens to be Leon's ex-son-in-law, where Leon was struggling to find some kind of a management situation. And Matt said, well, Larry, you might be the right guy. Let me go talk to Leon about it. I said, oh, really? Uh, so Matt sets up the conversation. Uh, Leon's in Nashville. Hey. And Leon says, well, Matt tells me you might be interested in uh, working with me as a possible management manager. And I said, well, Leon, I might be, but I got to tell you, I've booked you 30 or 40 times and you've never even spoken to me <laughs> other than thanks for the gig. And Leon said, oh yeah, my social, my social skills could stand some improving. So he's a very introverted guy. I know that he came out later on. He, he finally, uh, with some encouragement, was more uh, sociable to his fans. And I think he stayed around after a show and would sign autographs. That was, and the stories that he had, and I got to hear some of them on, on his bus. If you wanted to hear the stories that would, that would just curl your hair, get Leon talking about stuff that he had been involved in in his, his life in the music business, going back into the 50s here in Tulsa when he was, when he was Russell Bridges. Great stories and an incredible sense of humor. Very, very funny guy. And the last time I saw him was in Springfield, Missouri, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, I had him on a Leon, uh, Leon package, w Willie Nelson Leon package in Springfield at the mosque up there. But uh, J Jimmy Markham and I go on the bus and hear stories about, oh, just wonderful remembrances that he had. And I think Leon said he is planning to, to put his book together. Hopefully that, hopefully somebody comes comes up with enough energy and money to get that thing printed because uh, I want to buy a copy and read it. I want to buy the first copy. Great stories. I, I was never at a recording session at the church. I would suspect that those were fairly closed. You know, you can't really record with people dropping beer, beer cans and, and brooms, broom noise in the corner. So all I know was uh, it was, I don't want to call it a, a, a sacred place because it wasn't. But uh, the perception of people that lived here, especially music fans, there was a huge reverence toward what was going on at the church. You know, that, that was our studio. Stuff, we knew that something important was gonna come out of there. And you gotta remember, there were great, there were great musicians that were coming in and out of there. And, you know, we all know about George Harrison, we all know about Eric Clapton, but there were other musicians with, with ultimate talent that Leon was able to draw in here. He was a draw. He was, the people in the music business, the musicians knew how good he was and how capable he was. And uh, he, was, he was the magnet to do those people in here. You know, it was a creative center. The church was the creative center right here in Tulsa. It was a big damn deal. Tulsa's known, of course I'm from here, I'm from around here. And some, for some reason, this Tulsa area, this, this piece of land around here, these thousands of acres are, the musicians are coming out here. I don't know if it's in the DNA of the walls here, I'm sure it is, or the church studios. There's just some kind of an energy here that, that drew in the great musicians. They're born here, some of them moved in here. Um, I've got a lot of experience playing, my, promoting my shows in other cities. And let me tell you, it ain't like it. It's not like this in Oklahoma City. It's not like this in Little Rock. It ain't like this in Wichita. There's a magic aura about this. I mean, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm partial to this old building because I spent so much time here. There's just a lot that went on here and uh, it seemed like the musicians here were just from a different, uh, different mindset. The fact that the church is going to be reborn, okay? You know, because we all know that it was pretty essentially boarded up and it was on a street that was dead as it could be. 
Uh, the fact that the church is being reintroduced to the world, okay, that's, maybe that's a word I want, is exciting. And I think it's, it's going to stir up, it's going to rekindle that, uh, that draw of creative people back into town. With the, uh, with the influence of Kane's Ballroom, Brady Theater, and some of the, some of the lower level venues around here, there's a lot of musicians that are still coming that we don't know who they are yet. So there's gonna be all kinds of reasons for the church to be available for a possible recording of some great music that we don't know what it is yet. You know, I'm always, I'm always happy about the past. I'm a historian. I listen to everybody's story and try to remember it so I can tell somebody. But on the flip side, there's a bunch of history that hasn't been made yet. And the church is going to be a big part of that. And hopefully, it'll, and the reason why is it's going to be captured for the ages, either on video, uh, on tape. Uh, it's, a, it's a big future there. <laughs>